Hi, and welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis. This is week three, lecture two on linear calibration. So in this lecture, what I really want to explain to you is how to apply linear calibration to spectrometers of a variety of types. And we use these same ideas when we do chromatography as well. It's pretty fundamental in analytical chemistry. So the problem we're trying to solve this week is basically how to understand what I call the magic box. So instrumental analysis is really about using pretty amazing tools to quantify and understand the chemical composition of all sorts of things. And there's a real tendency and temptation to use these instruments as magic boxes. You inject a sample, it gives you a number, and you're done. But as I hope you're learning, there's a lot to know about what's inside the system and also a lot to think about in terms of how to use your information. So for example, in this magic box, we're given two numbers, but we don't actually know the units. So is it ppm or is it molarity? How do we take what will be a signal from a spectrometer, which often is a current, might be a voltage, you'll see in chromatography, it's a peak area, and how do we make that relevant in units that we actually care about? And that is sort of the process of translation that we have to do in a linear calibration procedure. It's putting known materials into our instrument of known concentrations, measuring the output signal, and from that, creating a calibration curve that helps us understand when we get any signal out of this instrument, what it means in terms of concentration of the material. A calibration curve then is the means by which we translate our instrumental data. They typically have an x-axis, which is concentration, and then we have a y-axis, which is some sort of signal. In this case, it could be amps, current, it could be a voltage, all sorts of things. In fact, it kind of doesn't matter to you what the signal is, just that it can be quantified in some fashion. And then what you do is you put a range of samples into the system and you measure this plot and create a calibration curve. And we'll talk a lot more about that in this lecture. It has to have a couple of features though to be useful. First of all, the slope of this line is incredibly important. It's called your response factor. And it's gonna be a very important parameter in interpreting all of your data from the instrument. Unfortunately, a lot of different books on the web, you'll hear all kinds of terms for it. You'll hear response factor, you'll hear instrument, instrument response, you'll sometimes hear instrument response function or response function, sometimes IRF, sometimes RF. So how I like to think about it, it's the slope of the line. And you'll hear me use a variety of these terms intentionally so that you can become accustomed to the different ways that people refer to this particular important feature of an instrument. You want your calibration curves to be close to zero at zero, with one important exception we'll see later this week, which is in the method of standard additions. Because at that basically says you have no offset in your data. Now, you can sort of live with an offset, but generally speaking, it's not a good thing if your instrument has too much of one. You're going to want the calibration curve to be linear. Um, every instrument, if you too much signal, too much material in, will eventually flatten out. You put more stuff in and you saturate your detector. It can't measure anymore. You might break it if it's a photo detector. So you want to be in the linear range. And you're going to evaluate that by looking at the R squared, which is a statistical parameter about the linearity of the plot. And sometimes they don't look as pretty as this. Sometimes you can have very noisy calibration curves. And that just translates into error in what you do with them. So, But what you want to be on the lookout for are curves that are just simply not linear. Now, the function that describes this curve is the classic y is equal to mx plus b, which m is the slope of the line and b is the y-intercept. So really, what we're going to be doing in today's lecture is talking about how to get to this particular equation from a set of points in a calibration curve. Finally, we're going to have to think about the range. So when you do a calibration, you decide the range. Do you go from 0 to 50 parts per million? Do you go to from 0 to 500? You want the range to match where you think you're going to be measuring. So if you're measuring lead and baby toys, and you kind of expect that it better not be more than 100 ppm, that might be your uppermost limit. So I want to start with a very common instance. So we're going to be doing a lot of spreadsheet work this week. However, I want you to be able to think through the calculations without using a spreadsheet. And so it's important then to understand the simplest version of a calibration curve, which is actually not a curve at all. It's what's called a single point calibration. So before I showed you five different data points that made up a, a line through them, but what if you just had one? You know, it was an estimate. So single point calibrations are super common because sometimes it can be expensive to fully calibrate an instrument, and sometimes it's not what you need. You just need a real ballpark number, let's say, in order to design an appropriate method. 
So in a single point calibration, you're given a single data point, a known concentration, always have to have a standard in a calibration, and a known signal that you measure. And from that, you're going to calculate the instrument response function, or the slope of this line. So in this case, we know that 1 ppm lead gave us 40 millivolts of signal. So the slope is just the rise over the run, or 40 millivolts, divided by 1 ppm, giving us 40 millivolts per ppm as an instrument response function. I want you to pay close attention to the units in this particular term. They're going to save you when you have to start to use this information, because you can cancel the units in the instrument response function, just as you would in any other chemical stoichiometric calculation. Now, what if we're given an unknown? So say you've done a single point calibration, just like we did. Took the rise over the run, assumed that zero is zero. Well, let's say I give you an unknown, and I say, wow, I got a signal of 20 millivolts. Well, maybe you can do that in your head, but what's the concentration? Well, what we're going to be doing is, of course, dividing the signal that we got by the instrument response function. Because when you do that, if you look down here, you can see that you'll cancel the millivolts. The ppm will end up on the top. Or you can just see it here. So by knowing the slope of the line for any y0 that you measure, and y0 is a term we use for the signal of an unknown, you can calculate x0, which is the concentration, which is usually what you're after in these kinds of analytical measurements. So let's talk a little bit about a manual calculation. I'm really hoping most of you will have access to a spreadsheet, but some of you won't. And who knows, maybe you're going to have to do a linear calibration in a spaceship somewhere, and you won't have access to a computer. And so you're going to have to know kind of what, how, would you, how would you calibrate something if you couldn't have a computer fit the line for you. What I'm showing you is an estimated method. It's really not something you can take to the bank, but it is going to get you a good round number in terms of estimating what your instrument response is. So here's a bunch of data over here shown to the left. The question is, how do you extract the slope? Well, so the first thing you have to know is that you're going to have to assume the y-intercept is zero. Then you're going to have to get the slope as calculating the rise over the run. But you have a lot of different options. You have a lot of ways of calculating the rise. You could go 260 minus 73. You could go 910 minus 460. You could go 1,000 minus 260. Here's my rule of thumb. <laughs> um, pick two examples from your data set. They can be kind of random. And just take delta y over delta x. And so in this case, I picked 216 and 73, and I divided by the difference in the x values associated with each of those, and I get a slope of 12.5. And then I literally randomly picked 1,000 and 460, and I did the same estimate. There's no real right way to estimate, um, but I usually pick two different values, and I calculate the slopes. Now, you'll notice these slopes are different, and that's because this is estimating, so it's not going to be giving you the same slope for every two data points. But it's pretty typical to always try to take two. If you want to take three or four and you have the time, go ahead. And then you're going to just average these, which in this case is 9.85 amps per ppm, realizing that significant figures mean very little. You might do a round number of you know, 9.8. And that's going to be a really useful starting point if you only want to get an estimate. And it's better than a single point calibration. If you have that, how are you going to then calculate x0? So once you have the slope of a curve, you can actually really rearrange the expression and say, OK, if I know the slope and the intercept for any given input signal, y sub 0, I can put it into this formula and calculate x sub 0. And you'll know automatically the units, because that's going to be governed by the units of the slope. And so this equation, you want to circle it and remember it, because you're going to be using it a lot this week. One other point I need to make um, is that when you do a calibration and you're basically extracting the concentration of an unknown. If that unknown concentration is in the range of the values you calibrated, that's called an interpolation. If that number is outside the range, it's an extrapolation. And in fact, the error approaches that we'll learn later are going to be a little bit different. OK, so let's talk a little bit about applying that formula if you don't have Excel. So for this, we're assuming we have that same chromium example from slide 13 except I had chosen two different points when I did this example, and I came up with a slope of 8.64, not equal to what I had before, because I picked two different numbers. And that's really here to point out that when you do that estimated method, you can come up with a lot of different slopes. So there can be a range of values that you get. In any case, we're going to take an IRF, or an instrument response function, or a slope of the line, to be 8.64. And what we're going to turn that into is a concentration. So in these two cases, we have two samples. One's 
one's 1189, and we got to figure out, okay, what's the concentration of each of those? There's our primary equation, and in this case, the intercept is zero, and so it turns into something pretty easy. And so in this case, it's the signal divided by the instrument response function. You'll notice you get a nice units cancellation in the signal units, so the amps cancel, and since it's 1 over 1 over ppm, ppm goes back to the top, and you have the right units. You can do the same for the other number and get a similar kind of answer. Now, I want to do some examples in Excel, and the example problems that we're going to be doing, I'll do a lot more Excel for you. But I want to point out that recently, um, Microsoft has made an open source version of Excel available. It doesn't have all the functions I would have liked for some of your statistical analysis, but it does have some of the crucial ones. So my advice is to go online, type in open source Excel, and you can use it on the web, and it works pretty well if you have a good internet connection. So I hope all of you can get Excel or through this route, or you have some source of a spreadsheet to work with. Now, how would you do the same problems I was estimating with Excel? Okay, this is the right way to do it. And if you were in a real deal analytical lab, you would use a spreadsheet every single day and you would use it constantly for data analysis. And so, for example, in this data set, what I've done, and this is a picture of the Excel sort of format, is I've written the lead and I've written the AES signal. And up in these two cells, I've written equal slope, the Y values and the X values. Equals means the function, slope says tell me the linear regressed slope. And there I have it, and there I get an intercept. So it just automatically does it, and it's going to do it for all the values in a statistically sound way. And so you're going to get the standard linear regression analysis one would expect. And you're going to make a chart that looks like this. So what this chart shows you is how I took the slope and the intercept, and I made a section where I type in into the orange box the AES signal, and then I predict the unknown using the formula shown here. And knowing it's exactly like what you saw before. It's the signal divided by the slope, or the signal divided by the instrument response function. The primary difference is that we now have a y-intercept. It's not zero, and so we have to correct for that y-intercept. So our signal is, gets subtracted from it, the y-intercept, and then we divide by that slope. And that's how we get the concentration of an unknown. So when you use Excel, you have the advantage of giving much more accurate slopes and intercepts. In the next lecture, we'll talk about how accurate and how precise they are. So I hope I've given you an idea about what to do with linear calibration. We're going to have a lot of examples that will be coming up, not next lecture, but the lecture after. And you'll see a lot of quantitative examples in both your quiz and your problem set. So please practice those. And thanks so much. I'll see you next time.